I'm not just going to go two days until trying he to get a ticket. Yeah, we're, we're good in this one. It, it, okay, you're fine. But, uh, I think they changed the rules, but it's a shame. No, they didn't change the rules. That's true. That's, this law is free every time. Uh, it's, it is? It's three is really. Is the sign change that? Or? No, the sign doesn't say it. Uh, Sloan had a change. Oh, that? Yeah. Oh, good. So it's. It's not that much space, but. It's a premium in all these ways. Well, it, well also the trick, the trick pattern discovered Amherst is not one way. That's the whole yeah. way. <coughs> and the cross streets are built here, and this is blocked. Too. And then there's one lane going to Boston, so everybody's jammed up and less. I should have listened to Wade's. That's what I was going to get here. No, I, I override by saying that <coughs> cut to Cambridge. Mistake. Oh, yeah. The Main Street was worse than this. Yeah, well, I, I came in, and I picked Jabber up at the uh, McDonald's at 148. And so I came in basically to Washington Street to come in with Evan. Well, if I stayed just to Rampart. Which McDonald's on, on the Newton? Yeah, like Newton? Newton? What? In, in Newton? Newton? That rest area where the gas station? Like it's that, just right. after exit 22 in South There's right. a gas station and a McDonald's, like a, a rest area. Yeah. <laughs> That's where he picks you up? Yeah. yeah. Less than less. But in order for you to get here, you have to go around. around and, and, yeah, way you have to go the other direction because you're coming from. He used to pick me up at the Marriott, but then they uh, they decided to start yeah. charging for parking there. In Newton? The Marriott mm -hmm. Newton? The Boston Marriott Newton, yeah. They started charging for parking there. The Marriott yeah. Newton now charges for parking. What? When did that start? A couple of months ago. Oh, they my God. They've had the case for a while. They did it for events. Which one? The Marriott Newton. On Commonwealth Ave, up there. I've been charged. there many, many times. We used to park, Jabber used to park there, and I used to pick him up there. <coughs> and then That's all terrible. of a sudden, one day, yeah. it was knocked <coughs> off. Well, I, 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 the gates have been there for yeah. a long time. This was not for events. This no, I understand. That's so terrible. There's uh, too many people to do that. <laughs> he parks now at... Um, the club, uh, uh, he parks now at the McDonald's on 128. Okay. Oh, that's one place. The other place is there's a club, a country club. Not to, uh, uh, Braver? Yeah, uh, Braver. No, not Braver. Woodland? Woodland. Woodland. That's. Yeah. Can you park there? Well, um, well I've no been there. <laughs> yeah. But I think for him, he comes up 128. Yeah. Anyway, so parking there is fine. And then. Or, well, I mean, but then he. But you have to do it. You turn. You have to come around and go the other direction. I want to He lives in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, actually, the good news is Brent Ross makes it much faster. It's been a long time. Mm. That's my biggest. <coughs> and maybe I keep it down to like when they first. Uh, <coughs> Square cars coming from Arlington, and I see him getting, uh, I see him getting motorcycle because I couldn't get parking. And then I got parking spot. Well, so, so Jeff, you're with MIT? Oh, yeah. Okay. I've been here for 40 years. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what's sad. <laughs> I used to park in the parking garage under the new, and I'm, I'm going by it. I'm stuck in the traffic, working my way down Main Street, to try to get here. And so I wonder if I just park in that parking garage. Now, for two years I parked in that parking garage. I don't remember how to get in. <laughs> Think I turned here, but which garage? The one under the under E52. Oh, oh, that. You, you, have, to you, you have to come in. Yeah, the old Main it's Street. tricky. You come in off Main Street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, That's I'm an ultra super top lots. secret you know, spot. Uh, mm. That's what you're talking about, Jeff. Is ultra super top secret. No one knows about no, that. The That's real like thing I need to figure out. <laughs> I don't want anyone else to know about it's that. How to, it's how to get the on one parking permit. Oh, well. That's not my concern. It's under the library. That that parking garage you're talking about. So I work in the Stata Center, and I have a permit for the Stata Center. Wow. Hey, Jeff. I've, I've been uh, trying for a lot of years to uh, to get a good IPv6 top. Yeah. I think we had like maybe five or six uh, uh, different talks over the years that, that they always, I, I always tell them I did not want an evangelist talk, but the audience is people who want to convert to IPv6 and like to see how to do it. No. And every person ever came to speak, uh, I guess, forgot that I told them that and just gave the standard evangelist talk. Well, 
I, I can, can you recommend anyone? What's that? I'm not a big fan of IPv6. No? Um, we screwed up. In what way? We, did it. <coughs> we should have made IPv6 be a superset of IPv4 so that IPv4 packets would work the same as an IPv6 packet. And we didn't. So like they did with this business, but they have like added digits that you can add on. And the argument that we succumbed to was in order to do, to make IPv6 be a superset of IPv4, you really need variable length addresses. And the hardware guys were just <coughs> don't dare to do that. We could never make it work. It'll be slow. It'll be. And, you know, we should have ignored them. As I said to a friend of mine about uh, IP address portability. Mm -hmm. I love this story. And some of you may have heard this before. Uh, I'm not being recorded now, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, something else well, I'll say Actually, the live stream is enabled. Is it on? Let me turn that off. Ah. I'm going to restart we'll the stream. We'll put it on the web for you. <laughs> We've got a camera and everything. <laughs> you know what they say, right? There's no such thing as the cloud. It's just someone else's computer. <laughs> um, I have quite a, I'm not going to say this on camera, though. I have quite a bit of experience using various clouds. Up here. Um, and uh, the, uh, it's getting to the time here. I'm going to fly down and visit my mom. Got to look presentable. You can see all the apps I have on my phone. The other nice thing about the active is it's not not only is it a rugged phone, it's got a bigger battery. Yeah, I like the battery. Yeah, it's like a I forget how big it is, but it's it's bigger than any of the other Samsung phones. Because the regular Samsung phones, they're worried about the weight, but they figure you're buying the active one, it's already going to be heavy, so yeah. what the heck's a little extra weight. Remember from? the days of replaceable batteries? The what? Replaceable batteries. Yeah, replaceable battery. I have a few of those phones that can still do that. Yeah, that's that's why the old phones I like you can change. I, I gave up those phones. I, I, at some point they couldn't get them. USB C got fast enough. Oh, phones yeah. gonna be safe ripped apart and have a battery put in it. In fact, so this laptop is an interesting laptop. I had a MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. Two mid 212. No, two, mid 2012. And it started to fail. And there was something wrong with the hardware. Like the keyboard would lock up until you power cycle the kind of thing. It's like, yeah, it's giving me a hint. And I did not like the new MacBook Pros. I did not like the ones with the USB-C and the horror stories of the keyboards. And what I did with the MacBook Pro is I basically ran VMware and ran a Linux virtual machine on it and do all my work in Linux. So this, I finally, this is a Dell that I bought that came with Linux on it. Did you use Termix on Android? Um, actually, I have both Termex and Userland. Okay. Yeah, Userland, I think, works a little bit better. Oh, okay, I'm trying. But it, it's the same thing. It's, it's you know, basically uh, a Linux Userland running on the phone. The question is, can I write an app in Node using it that comes up treated as an app and close it in Node? That I don't know. To me, it means I can run Emacs on the phone. That's, that's, that's my yeah, it's, With an actual keyboard, yes. Yeah, with an actual keyboard. I can actually SSH into the phone and run Emacs. So, you don't like USB-C or you don't like USB-Cs on Mac? Well, in particular, I didn't like them getting rid of the MagSafe connector. And, uh, and all of my USB sticks, of which I have more than a few, are all USB-A. So this one has two USB-A ports and a USB-C USB port. USB-C power? What? Was a, I, I was Unfortunately, I have the big barrel power connector. No, I was up at the morning. Uh, it was on a plane with times recently that it only had USB-A and USB-C. And the USB-C had enough to have a laptop and no other connector. So mm. Thunderbolt. So just that's for the future. It's going to be USB-C. Well, this thing running on batteries, mine. One of the nice things about Linux is you can tune the hell out of it. I can get 10 to 12 hours out of it. So, I mean, right now I'm not, I'm, I haven't, it has different uh, programs in the BIOS, so I have a program for, I'm mostly always on AC power, so it doesn't charge the battery all the way up. Um, well, I should show you my phones with, 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 with,
Well, this phone, I, the phone I tend to only charge through the cable. And I, I don't use, it can do fast charging over the cable, but I tell it not to no, do that. I've got them on my wall, and even without fast charging, come, Nokia, when I learn what the Nokia name, cannot make a phone that can stay plugged in. No. Well, this phone can stay plugged in, but it will then charge the battery up to 100%. Right. Well, the problem with Nokia, when the battery gets bigger. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Actually, one of the nice things with this laptop is in the bias, you can actually say it, never charge the battery over 80%. Yeah. And don't start charging until it drops below 50%. No, that's why I can't. I and that always throws me off. I'm like, why is it not charging? It's only up to 80. Why is it not continuing charging? Right. Well, that's no. like, that's the Tesla mode. I mean, it makes sense, but they don't tell you that. It just does it. No, well, they don't understand you why. Know, that's, that's the problem. problem. It's like, it's they don't tell you. They don't think. You see the user manuals in these new machines that says here, plug it in and turn it on. No, it's that's just it. That they don't even tell <coughs> you. It should be called 100%. And well, the thing is on this one. Then you get 120. In other words, you label it 80% uh, yeah. 100%. Oh, well, so this machine, if you put it in that mode, which I have, yeah. when the battery is at 80%, it says it's 100%. It what's reports the, it out. What's the mode? Uh, it's called plugged in all the time mode. Okay. So is it BIOS or is it a BIOS? Oh, it is. Okay. It's a BIOS setting. So there's a Dell supported program for setting it from you know from running from the running system. So it's a driver. It, it, it's an amazing amount of working knowledge on this. Well, you ever looked at the source code of the boot up sequence of uh, any PC? No, very, very Do you know why they have that 80% mode? Fuck, because the batteries last longer. If you don't no, know. they caught, they catch fire. And they have to prevent that because it's sued too much for the battery. Oh, that, that might be their reason. Because, but, yeah, because they overheat. But there's also it, just a general stop. rule that the batteries will. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a test of I mean, I bought a surface and the freaking thing, you, you touched the surface and then it was shocked and it touched the, the outside of it. That was the first surface. So, so, so the battery. Yeah. They were buying a whole pile of 1866 batteries. They're nickel metal hydride oh. batteries. Yeah. And they're called 1866 because they're 18 diameter and 66 long. And what were they used for, like special lights or something? No, they're for my wife's car. And what? what she she has the very, the very first hybrid car ever on the road in the United States, on the inside model year 2000. Mm -hmm. And these nickel metal batteries, <coughs> 95. Oh, so but you can, yeah, but you'd have to solder them in then. Or yeah. That, yeah. It's well, it, it, it makes more sense than buying a new car. We really want to keep this car going. So the third <laughs> battery pack. So the first battery pack. Oh, how many packs ago? This is this is well, this will be number four. They're pretty expensive, aren't they? Oh, oh, so it's just one. They're pack. like it's not several a packs. A couple of thousand dollars or something. Well, so what happened was when we bought the car before we bought it, we said to the dealer, "Remember, this is two thousand. How long will this battery will the batteries last?" Seven years. Said, we don't know. I said, "How much will it cost to replace them when they fail?" Mm -hmm. We don't know. I said, "That's not good answers." The dealer calls us the next day. He says, "I got an answer for you." So what is it? He says, Honda will warranty it for 80,000 miles or eight years. Right, but they had to. Yeah. yeah. I said, good. So we bought the car, and at 90,000 miles in oh. nine years, the yeah. pack failed. So, so, uh, okay, so, you you got, so it was a good though. warranty. You've got to give Honda credit for calculating. No, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, let me finish. <laughs> so we take the car to the dealer, and they say it's going to be $5,000 to replace the battery pack. Reasonable. $5,000? It's a nice little old car. So we thought about it, right? Now, by the way, the car is drivable without the batteries. Oh, really? Yeah, because yeah. it had a limp home capability. Oh. Because it was the first. Um, but you have to charge the 12 volt battery with a manual battery charger every two days. Because it, it doesn't have an alternator. It charges the 12 volt battery from 100. So bring a couple of 12s and put it in the car. But anyway, <laughs> the dealer calls us back and says Honda will pay for it. Why? Even though it's out of warranty. Well, that was beautiful. That was nice. It's so that was battery pack number two. Experience. So then when that one failed, okay, which How failed sooner. What? How many miles did you get on it? Um, I don't know how many miles we got on that pack. We're currently almost at 300,000 miles. Oh. And uh, so, you, so they're, they're using you as a test case. Yeah. And so, wait, wait this the second one lasted. I think yeah, the second one I think lasted also about 90,000. Okay. So the and, and and so the dealer wanted I think 4,000 to replace it. And we said, why is it so expensive? So we have to replace all the computers and all. No, you don't. You just have to do just replace the battery pack. And software updates. Right. So that was a thousand dollars. So that's what we did. Oh, how'd you get the price down? Just we said, I don't want to replace all the controller boards. I just uh, want to replace well, they, 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 the thing that holds the batteries. So technically, they should have replaced it because you don't want fires. You no, these are nickel metal hydro. No, no, the controllers. You don't want fires because the controllers screw up. That's the only thing you're risking. <laughs> that no, fire? Nickel metal hydride doesn't burn. Lithium ion burns. Not nickel metal hydride. 
I had to replace the battery in, in my first Tesla. Oh, really? 2013, yeah. I was pulling into the parking lot at the gym, and the battery died. So I went into the gym for my workout, and I called the uh, Tesla support. They sent a truck out there, towed my car down to Tesla and down, and ordered a new battery under warranty. The battery weighs 2,000 pounds. Yes, it is this pathway. They had to ship it from um, Nevada, where they make the batteries. Truck pulls up to Nevada, battery's fully charged, ready to go. We can't take a fully charged battery. Who can? Oh, it's oh, like, shipper, it's like the other shipper. Ones. Oh, that's so they had to discharge the battery, so that took took them a while, and then they shipped it out. So lightful. <laughs> and then, well, well, if, if in order, to, I was taking red eye night. And then I wrecked the car. <laughs> Oh, is that red eye ninety? In order to get on the plane, how do you wreck a Tesla suitcase? Oh, right. Yeah, well, hey, 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 Jerry. I was <laughs> next to a uh, semi trailer. Semi trailer went that way. Oh, hey, yeah. Front of you. Hey, Jerry. Actually, no. It was probably my fault. I was to the right of him. He didn't see me at all. We should get. We should start out. You did play one. You can start. Well, I can, I can just so you want to introduce him? What? You want to introduce him? Yeah, say hi. <laughs> yeah, we know who Jeff is. That's how I know where to edit it from the video. Jeff is a long, long time MIT uh, IT manager. He's been around a long time, spoken here several times, and they even let him in the building. Yeah, I was wondering if the, if the door was locked or not. We had a problem in the install fest. Uh, I got in the building, and then uh, the janitor came up and said, You can't have a meeting here. I said, why? We're scheduled. And he says, he's got new orders. He can't let anyone in unless they have a work order. And I asked about that afterwards when they were yeah, in contact. That, yeah. And they and said they had never heard anything about that. But I, I've known the janitor for several years. He let us in because we, apparently, there are people that leave rooms of mess, stuff yeah. like that. We always go overboard to leave it the way we found it. We tried to. Unless we get some street credit. That's <laughs> <laughs> the BCS affiliation? Yeah, that happens. You never seen that before? Who looks? Well, who signs? So this is the old BCS or new BCS? Yeah. No, the old one. Yeah, this is a reference. This is Oh, that's so part of it's the really BCS just not. Time. Oh, I guess I'll be a BCS credit, but I'll call my But you're not MIT. Well, Yeah, then yeah. check that off. Yeah. They want to know MIT. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, nobody's been a member for the past 23 years because it ceased to exist 23 years ago. That's why it's possible. That's where people who used to be affiliated with it. Okay. Well, I used to be affiliated with MIT. Yeah, so you should be checking out both of them. Okay. So let me let me uh, tell you guys what I've been doing for the last eight years. So I'll, if you know who I am, you know I ran the network for more than 25 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, but starting in 2011, I was put on permanent loan to the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab, in particular Hal Abelson. Hal had gone on sabbatical, extended sabbatical, in 2007. Went to Google and built this thing called Google App Inventor which is what I'm going to show you and talk to you about. And uh, after his sabbatical was over, he continued to work on it at Google. And when Google Labs shut down, um, they were going to kick everything out. And he asked if he could take the project to MIT. And Google App Inventor became MIT App Inventor. And around that time, by the way, in those days we had three orders of magnitude fewer users. Hal was terrified about running an infrastructure, because it's, it's a big deal, and it is a big deal. And so he was really interested in could I help them out, and due to some things that were going on in is it was a really good time, I thought, to do something different for a while. And so I said, sure, and the arrangements were made, and I moved into the Stata Center and became part of the App Inventor team, which has always been a very small team. So what is App Inventor? So App Inventor is a graphical authoring environment for building mobile applications. It's actually quite the complex system because there's parts of it that run on your phone, there's parts of it that run in a browser, and then there's a server 
that handles the projects and data storage and authentication and all that good stuff. The system runs in Google's App Engine. And the significance of Google App Engine is that uh, originally, so, so we say Amazon eats their own dog food, right? What Amazon offers to the public is what they use for running their own infrastructure. Google does not eat their own dog food. They have a proprietary internal infrastructure, and App Inventor was written against that infrastructure. But obviously, it couldn't continue to run on that if it came to MIT. So a team from Google that was loaned to MIT for six months ported the code from the internal Google system to what was called App Engine, which was their then public facing uh, platform. It has its own SDK. At the time it had two. It had a Python SDK and a Java SDK. Uh, the App Inventor backend code's all written in Java. Uh, and, uh, and we, by the way, in the, and our sources are on GitHub, but if you look at the repo, the history only goes back to 2011. They re-imported all the code because they were worried that the history before that might have Google proprietary information in it. So they actually had a <coughs> clean the repository. And uh, there was actually a period of time where there was not a public service, where Google shut it down, but MIT wasn't ready to go live. Uh, but in March of 2012, we had enough of a system working that we did go live. And uh, today, we have 1.2 million monthly active users, 300,000 weekly active users, 80,000 plus daily active users, depends on the day. I have three asterisk developers. There's three full-time developers. Uh, that includes me, even though I have a few other responsibilities at MIT as well. Uh, and a new, we have a new person, a fourth person that we just hired two weeks ago who's coming up to speed. And we have one DevOps person, which is basically me. One, one question. Yeah? The app engine, is that, what else, does that still exist for other purposes at Google? Uh, well, it's a, it's a public platform for basically implementing websites that are active. Uh, it has its own database called Bigtable, which is a, a NoSQL database. Um, I, I can look it up. So yeah, yeah. There's, there's, one of the things we worry about is, you know, we're not so certain how much Google's committed to keeping it going in the future. It does not, if you, if you look at what Google Cloud offers, it's not one of the items that's near the top of the marquee. And they've okay. been done the campaigns. And you can't get a copy of it yourself? No. It's a proprietary infrastructure. But I, don't worry, I have an answer for that. Uh, and then our support is done by a volunteer core of people we call the power users, who basically provide support. And we give them goodies once in a while. I already said this started at Google Labs, came to MIT, ran on that. Okay, fine. And now I'm going to do a demo, maybe. So let's see. Where's my other window? No, screw it, I'll just do it here. Uh, no, I won't. I'm going to. There it is. It's hiding right here. Yeah, where's my visor? <laughs> okay, so stop that. So visor is actually showing you on the screen what's actually on my phone. And it's so weird that that moves. So what you have here is an app up in what we call the designer. So the designer is where you do your UI design. And this is called Hello Per. This is our equivalent to Hello World. Mm -hmm. And you can build this app in about a minute. Okay? It's the very first app. And if you'll note here, one of the things we do is we upload two things. We upload a picture of a cat. That's the kitty you see. I uploaded a meow sound. And this picture of the cat that you see is really a button. In fact, let me deconstruct this thing. What the heck, right? I'm going to go over here to button one, and I'm going to delete it. So now you really want to delete it? Yeah, delete, good, gone. So button one's gone. But actually, let me, before I continue, let me connect the companion app, call this the MIT AI2 companion. I'm actually going to scan the QR code. And that's just for the mobile side. Well, that's, I'll explain what that does in a second. And it's going to give me an error, which I'm going to click through because. I have the wrong version of the companion, but it will work just the same. It's not even complaining. Why is it not complaining? No. Problem for another day. Anyhow, I'm going to take a button and I'm going to drag it onto the palette. And appears on the phone a button. So our claim to fame is we call this incremental development. It's what you see is what you get. 
Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to say, it's good. we're going to get rid of the text so the button has no text. But instead, we're going to give the button an image, which will be the cat. All right, we can make it a lot good. I forgot I uploaded a lot. Ooh. <laughs> Except that's not working. Is it a PDF? Oh, because it's a PDF, duh. Yeah, that's not going to work very well. Actually, tonight is the Latka party. All right, so now we have the cat. And if I push it, it doesn't do anything, right? No action. But now, I mean, if I'm here, I'm going to switch to the blocks. And this is our blocks editor. I can go to the button thing, and these are all the things you can do with the button. And I'm going to pull out the one that says, when button one is clicked. And now I'm going to go over to the sound component. I didn't show you me dragging the sound in, but it was already there. It was a non-visible component. We're going to say play. And in fact, let me come back to the designer and make sure that our sound component, <coughs> the source, shall be the meow. Okay. So now the blocks say, when click, play the meow sound. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag the sound out. Touch the cat, nothing happens. Plug the block in. Nothing happens. Oh, you know why? Because my phone <laughs> is in do not disturb you. mode. <laughs> okay, let's, let's do this again. Drag the button out. Nothing happens. Drag that in. And now the cat meows. And you're a genius. <laughs> okay. So that's the basic operation of App Inventor. So you use this graphic tool to build apps, and you can actually see the app come alive using what we call our companion app as you build the app. And we use this as a teaching tool. Our primary target audience, although our audiences can be anybody, but our primary target audience are, are typically middle, middle school to high school to college students. And it turns out from a pedagogical standpoint, this helps them learn, we call this computational thinking. You know, computers at some level are the ultimate logic machine. Look at the right? If You're right, if this, then that, okay? And the other thing it does, which is more subtle, is it turns them from consumers of technology into makers of technology. I've been to some of these classes. I was actually, we were doing a class up at Cambridge Ridge in Latin. And you see these kids, these were, I think, ninth grade kids. And at first, of course, they're ninth graders, and this was the ninth graders who were not taking the MCAS. So we, and, and you know, this was, like a, 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 this was like a free day for them, right? Classes they weren't going to get graded on, and they came in, and some of them were pretty rambunctious, but they started to do it. And when they actually got something to work, I don't think we did this, we think we did ball bounce, which you put a ball and you watch it bounce around. The eyes lit up. It's like, wow. <laughs> and one kid says to me, can I make my ball be green? I said, you can make it whatever color you want. Just don't make it something I'm seeing here. <laughs> OK? What do you mean to say? Yeah, you can put a picture there. So this is what it does. But what I'm going to talk about today, obviously I've shown you how it works, is the magic behind it. How do we make this work? Just a question. Can I see text representation go back and forth between text and graphics? We have somebody working on that. We actually have a thing for turning. I'm going to show you what text representation okay. is. But not for you. But well, we actually we do have some experimental code to turn it into Python code. Oh, nice. but the other question is how young can you go with this? Well, we have a project in Hong Kong where they're using it with primary school kids. So we're dealing with kids who are 10 and 11. Okay. okay. Um, and there's actually contests. Now we have, by the way, are in every country on the planet but two. We have users in North Korea and Bolivia. No, we have two users in North Korea. <laughs> okay. We don't know who they are. You know, is it Kim Jong Un at gmail.com? <laughs> we don't know who they are, but we have two users that Google Analytics says are in North Korea. The only two countries we've not been in is Chad and the Central African Republic. We have users in all other countries. Um, including China, which blocks Google App Engine. I'll come back to that. So anyway, this is what it does. We, by the way, are a round-the-clock operation because we have users in all these different countries. Uh, our power users who are offering support speak a quite a few number of languages. Is it 
It's in native languages. We're, we support 12 languages right now. If I click up here, these are the languages we support. We have Deutsch, English, Espanol, Francais, Magyar, Italiano. I think that next one is Korean, Netherlands, Polsky, Portuguese, and Portuguese do Brazil. You know, both. We have Russian, Swedish, and two forms of Chinese. By the way, one of the challenges we have with this is we don't speak any of these languages, at least certainly not Chinese. And we'll have one guy say, oh, no, 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 that's not the right Chinese for this. It's these other characters. And the, first, the other guy, no, no, I'm right. I'm. It's like, come on, guys. I, I can't sort this out. But no Japanese. What is interesting is, let me, let me switch to uh, Chinese here. So now everything's in Chinese. Now what's kind of cool is if I, if I ask Google Translate, it has to reload it. That's going to break my connection, but all right. So now I'm going to have Google Translate translate it. Translate so this page. Paste. Is it paste it? Or? No. So this is the English that Google Translate has translated back. Well, I assume you Google Translate to get the, the first place. No, no, the, 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 we have native speakers. Okay, so Google Translate's offering, you know, let's say, off. Yeah, actually, we used a service called, a system called Poodle for the translations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did away with that because Google, uh, the Google Translation Toolkit was much better, except they're shutting it down this month. What did it shut down? Google, Google tra Translate Toolkit. Is, uh, <laughs> Not the translate, the language translator. But no, but the... Uh, the crowdsourcing system for translation. Hmm. I never used that. So anyway, here we have Chinese translated by mechanically back to English, and occasionally there's a little oh, so it's simplified Chinese. Yes. Uh, well, simple, yes. Feedback question guide. Let's see. One of these. Once upon a time, we had a uh, a uh, menu that said debug, and uh, the Chinese translate back to English said find errors. So yeah, I guess that's the bunny. Logical design. So we are in the block set. Of course, that, that's not translating. Anyway, let me go back. Let me get rid of this. Let's go back to English. Hopefully it'll work. Yep. And let me actually go back to my slides. Actually, before I do that, let's come back here. Let's actually I'm going to disconnect that and go away. And I'm going to go back to there, F, and we're good to go. All right, let me talk a little bit about the, 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 the pieces of this. So there's a web server written in Java running on Google's app engine. Most of the real work, moving those blocks and doing all the work, that's happening in the browser. And the browser is directly talking to the phone. So when you update what you saw in the browser, it's sending it in real time to the phone. Um, now, App Engine, oh, and the browser is written in both JavaScript and using a thing called the J Google Web Toolkit, which is a tool for writing code in Java that gets compiled to JavaScript to run in the browser. So the designer, the part where you drag the buttons around, that's written in GWT, and the blocks editor is written in JavaScript. And gluing those two together is a pain in the butt. Um, now, App Engine was designed for serving web pages, and as such, you can do very limited computation on each hit. Yet, when somebody's done building their app, they actually want to build a binary. They want to build a package that they can put on their phone that's basically a native speed app. And so to do that, you can't do that in App Engine. So instead, we have a series of build servers. These are Linux boxes running, again, a different Java program that calls the various tools that, that Google has for building packages. And it typically takes about 30 seconds to build a package. So what will happen is you'll say, to the, you'll say on, on the, in the browser, please build me an APK, and you have your choice to store it on your computer or put up a barcode you can scan with your phone. And it will then ship the job off to the build server, say to the build server, please build this. The build server will work on it. When it's done, it, it, it's provided a callback URL. It will post to that callback URL, here's your finished thing. Now, it is computationally intensive to do these builds, so we actually have uh, 12 eight core virtual machines spinning doing the builds. And each will do 30 simultaneous builds. And uh, 
In fact, one time when we only had, I think, six of them running, um, we noticed the load was very high. There were a lot of bills, and it was like a weird time. And we discovered there was a contest in Brazil, in Brazil, that was using App Inventor, and you had to submit the compiled app, and it was getting close to the deadline. <laughs> so we had to spin up a few more build servers. So those are running on campus, and, and CSAIL has an open stack cloud. Finally, there's a thing called the MIT AI2, App Inventor version 2 companion. That's the app you saw me run on the phone. That's the companion app. Um, we're in production today with Android. We have a version of the companion that runs on iOS. And in fact, one of the things we do that nobody else can do is you use the same website and the same tools to build for iOS or Android. So a teacher in a class using the companion can have students using both iOS and Android. Android phone, you're good to go. iOS phone, you're good to go. And we're not in production with iOS, mostly because we're not yet in the Apple App Store. And getting things in the Apple App Store is very, very hard, particularly what we're doing. Because technically what we're doing, they officially say you're not supposed to do. But there are special exceptions for educational apps. And so we fit in that category, but we are, I don't want to say we're jumping through the hoops because we're still trying to find out where the hoops are. Uh, but we do have a beta test app and we have people using it and it does work. Uh, one of the servers we have is what we call the rendezvous server. So you saw me scan a QR code. What was going on there is, is the communication between the companion and the browser was not going through this cable. This cable was just for visor and the screen display. The communication was going over Wi-Fi, really just going over the internet. And for that to work, you have to rendezvous the phone to the browser, and that's done by the browser displaying the QR code, which contains necessary information for the, two, for the phone and the browser to find each other. Now, I have a different slide that says how they talk to each other, and the answer is two different ways. Either, either we run a web server on the phone, we call that the legacy mode, and the modern mode is we're using WebRTC to talk between the phone and the browser. And there's problems with both approaches. Finally, we have a server we call the CloudDB server. And what that does is it's basically a shared database it's for shared variables. So you can actually write an app where you have a variable in the app that when somebody sets it, everybody who has that app will see the change. So it's sort of like Firebase. In fact, we wouldn't have written CloudDB, we would have just used Firebase, except that Firebase was bought by Google. Now, we do have a Firebase component. If you want to use Firebase, you can use it. The reason <coughs> we wrote CloudDB is because when Firebase, the company, was bought, Google deprecated the client-side API and said, we're integrating it into Google Play services, which is fine. However, a lot of our users have Fire tablets, the Amazon Fire tablet, which does not have Google Play services. Now, it turns out Firebase still works on that platform because although they deprecated the client-side SDK, they have not changed the wire protocol. But they could do that tomorrow. So, because, you know, we're, we're living on borrowed time. So CloudDB is our replacement for that. And it's a server we run, and the actual workhorse engine underneath this is Redis. So if you're familiar with Redis, Redis does the heavy lifting. So you, in terms of that, you can... You can do shared distributed apps. Yes. Sounds like fun. Yeah. In fact, our educational people, we have a, a whole education team. Okay? Boy, did they torture me. Okay? So the first version of CloudDB was written by a grad student who was interested in doing research on what students can use it for. And it was typical grad student kind of work. I mean, her, her goal was to get her thesis done. Mm -hmm. And it turns out the uh, education people decided to write a shared app called Sketch and Guess. So one student sketches <laughs> an image on the phone, and the other student sees it, and they're supposed to guess what it is. So, it, it, you know, it's always be. so we're doing <laughs> variable sets on drag events, which come by the thousands per second. So it was like the acid test. And then the first version of CloudDB, you got a dotted line, because we were missing events. Now you get a smooth line. We beat it up. 
And uh, so we have a front end, basically, in front of Redis that handles queuing the load. And also, Redis was not designed as a multi-user database. So we added the multi-user and authentication layer and the encryption layer. So it's actually even vaguely secure. Um, and it's vaguely private because we play games with the UUID. In other words, if I find an object stored in the Redis database, I actually can't figure out who, who owns it. I, I, can't, I can't run it backwards. It's, it's a hash in the wrong direction. So that's, that's our CloudDB. All right, so I've already said the web server is written in Java. We use Quid and Quid. Now here's the interesting thing. So on Android, so we have these things we call components. Those are, when you see a block, like when button one click, what does that mean? It means there's a button component on the phone that's handling the click. So all of our components are written in Java on Android, and in iOS they're written in Swift. But here's the kicker. The thing that glues it all together is Scheme. Basically, the internal name of the MIT AI2 companion is the REPL for read eval print loop. The companion app is a fancy scheme interpreter. Finally, we have a login server. So it used to be you logged in directly to App Inventor. Now what happens when you go to App Inventor, we bounce you to this extra server that's not in Google land. It does the login and then bounces you back. And it's fast enough that you don't notice it. So scheme. So here's the magic. When you write a block, we translate that block into scheme code, and the scheme code gets sent to the phone. And when you change the behavior of, of a block, that effectively is redefining the function, and we send the new function definition, and the behavior changes. And I actually can show you. And so on Android, we're running a scheme system called Kawa, K-A-W-A. And it's a scheme written in Java. And what it lets you do is it lets you run interpreted or compiled. So the build server, when you package an app, will actually take that scheme code and compile it down to Java bytecodes, which, of course, on Android then gets compiled down to, to uh, what you would call it, Dalvik, and then compiled down to Oat to run in native speeds. Now, on iOS, we're using a scheme called Pikmin. Um, and it's a compatible enough scheme that the, the, it all just works. So here's my example. This is what the programmer sees. They see a button one click. That gets stored in their project in an XML representation. And that's the actual representation of when button one is clicked, call the play method of the sound component. So this gets stored. We even store it pretty printed, it turns out. You wonder how much money we'll save if we don't pretty print it. Yeah? Uh, I thought you said they get turned into Scheme. Ah, this is how it's stored in the project. Oh, okay. When it's sent to the phone, it gets turned into Scheme, and this is, this is what that looks like. So you'll see we're calling for button one, add component screen one, com.mumble mumble. Now, Scheme does not have a thing called add component. We actually have a macro layer. So we have a bunch of macros written in Scheme, and this is calling that macro, those Scheme macros. And uh, we call the uh, internal language Yale, which stands for Young Android Intermediate Language, or yet another intermediate language. Exactly. But it's basically Scheme uh, macros. All right, let's talk about them. This is a little bit hairy. When I first wrote, and this is one of the first things I did as a developer on App Inventor, but when I came on board, you had to use a USB cable to connect the phone to the laptop. And that was a horror show, because on Windows, each phone required a different USB driver, and some phones didn't have USB drivers. So kids would come to class with their phones, they'd plug them in, and they'd have to install drivers. And if they used a different computer the next time, they had to install drivers. It was a horror show. So Hal said, could I come up with some scheme to use the network, to use Wi-Fi? So I came up with the whole rendezvous scheme, et cetera, et cetera. But the first version of this is the problem is browsers can't open a TCP connection. It's not what they do. But they can do AJAX requests. So we run a web server on the phone. And as when the, when the scheme changes, we package up the change scheme and fire it off as an AJAX request to the phone. So the rendezvous server, when you start the phone, okay, 
Well, I should put it this way. When you're on, when you're on the browser and you say connect and it puts up that QR code, the browser makes up a code, a six letter code. It then starts polling the rendezvous server. I got this code, who's the IP address? Who's the IP address? Once a second, who's the IP address? Meantime, on the phone, when you scan it, the phone posts to the rendezvous server, hey, here's my code and here's my IP address. The next time the browser does a poll, it gets the answer. And then it talks to that on port 8001. That's the port we use from the phone, because we can't buy in port 80 because that's a privileged port. That's how we used to do it. But here's the problem. I don't know if you were paying attention, but when we were connecting to, turns out, code.appinventor.edu, which is one of the other instances that I run, there was no HTTPS there. It was just HTTP. The day is going to come where schools are going to come to us saying, you're in violation of our policies because you're not encrypted. Right? We know that's coming. Because Google's been putting this big push, everything should be encrypted, which, by the way, I don't necessarily disagree with. Okay, you're gonna to want to see the slides I just did. Oh, so you won't go back. My wife left the phone in the left car. Oh. So <laughs> these are the blocks that you see. This is what's stored in a project in an XML representation, and here's the scheme it gets turned into. So our actual implementation language is scheme for the blocks. Okay, JavaScript is close to scheme. Anyway, where was I? Back here. So this is how it worked. But like I said. Um, we're not being served over HTTPS. But here's the rub. If we are served over HTTPS, then the browser won't talk to the phone. Because the browsers implement a rule that says if a page is loaded via HTTPS, then all the AJAX calls it makes have to be over HTTPS. This well, is exactly the problem I said about browsers being too smart. Well, the reason the browsers have to be smart, okay, is because the web server people are, are Devious. No, well, no, because no. what they would do is your local utility company to save a couple of bucks on performance, they'll serve the login page HTTPS and turns green, everybody looks happy. But when you actually type your name and password, it's going to do HTTP and not encrypt it. And uh, again, I'll talk to you later about the problems with home control in that. Anyway, well, this is probably the same problem I'm about to tell you. So the browsers don't let you talk via AJAX to a non HTTPS location if you were loaded over HTTPS. The problem is there's no way on God's green earth that I can run HTTPS on the phone. I mean, I could, but in order for it to work, the phone has to have a certificate issued exactly. by a public certificate authority. Exactly the problem. Not right. to mention you've got to start with a, dom a domain name. Yes. Well, guess what? Phones don't have domain names, and, you, and people who have phones don't know what a certificate is. You need your light switches. All right? And you're just not going to get one. You're just not going to get one. So it's just it's one of those can't get there from here. So legacy mode will only work as long as we're not served over HTTPS. So to deal with that, I implemented WebRTC. So now, when you talk to the rendezvous server, instead of just giving it a code, we do a whole big folder all WebRTC negotiation, which let me tell you, is serious black magic. Okay? Mm. Getting that to work. All right? So when I did my demo, okay, that was using WebRTC, but if you saw the little progress bar while I was connecting, there was one point where it said, please wait, rendezvous. And that's just a four second pause so that the various, what they call ICE candidates, can flow back and forth and I have enough data. And the, the uh, four seconds was a wild ass guess for what would be enough. Now that's just friggin' dumb. Now by the way, when I first implemented it, it worked fine. But it didn't work in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. The Hong Kong people were complaining to me that it wasn't working. Now the rendezvous servers here in the United States, they're in Hong Kong. So what I did was, to test this, I set up a rendezvous server in Hong Kong and tried to use it from the United States, and indeed it didn't work. So I banged on it with trial and error. So I might add that, uh, so WebRTC on the browser is in the browser, you know, the implementation. On the phone, there's actually, I'm not using, I could use a web view and use that implementation, but we discovered not all the phones have a decent implementation of web view, okay? And I should say, by the way, and I'm sorry for doing this in a lot of order, we support schools. We support schools all over the world. Most schools, particularly not in the United States, are not made of money. These kids use phones that are like five years old or older. So we have to, right now, we support all the way back to Android 2.2. 
cool. foil, okay? And that is hard, okay? Because, so for example, we also want kids to build their apps to put them in the Play Store. And Google has a new rule in the Play Store that you have to support, you have to quote unquote target a more modern version. But then they offer a compatibility library, but that compatibility library today only goes back to ice cream sandwich. And uh, this is, so we actually found a library that does WebRTC and native code on the phone. And it's actually in C code. So the companion's big because it contains a, a um, x86 implementation and two ARM implementations um, that it then selects at runtime as the right one to use. But the other problem we have is in schools. Schools think they're connected to the internet, but they're not. Schools have something else inside that is sort of like the internet, but it's like the internet run by an IT person whose primary view on the world is fear and lack of knowledge. And so they tend to have, I mean, one of the challenges we had to face was uh, the laptops are on Wi-Fi, the phones are on Wi-Fi, but they program their access points to uh, not allow devices on the same Wi-Fi to talk to each other. And that's an implementation, it's not standard, but everybody implements it for hotels. Because hotels don't want two guests on the same Wi-Fi hacking each other. Well, schools turn that on too. Well, kids shouldn't be talking to each other. So we gotta get them to turn that off. And then the port 80 program. Well, we're using port 8001, which is even worse. So yeah. we say, you gotta open port 8001 for this to work. And also, if you're using a USB cable, you gotta open port 8004, which is a whole other story. The problem we have with WebRTC is WebRTC uses not TCP, but UDP. And it uses a random port. So when I say to the schools, you've got to open this big range of ports, they say, our IT people will never let us do that. You need a tunnel that complete internet to port right. And I can't <laughs> control that because I don't control the implementation in the browser. It's the browser that picks the ports. So we have that headache. And it's a big headache. And we're seeing, we still are trying to bang our head against the wall until we find out a, a, a clever way to deal with it. But we mostly, so what we tell them today is if WebRTC doesn't work, use legacy mode. And so what I fear we may ultimately have to do is we may ultimately have to support a legacy .app inventor mid edge that loads not over HTTPS. And so if WebRTC works for you, you can use HTTPS, and if it doesn't, then you, you can't. But that'll be yet another thing we have to maintain. All right, let me talk about the infrastructure. Besides App Engine, the rest of our infrastructure runs on Linux. And at the moment, I've standardized on Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, started via Cloud Init. Um, and we use AWS as Route 53 for DNS. I mostly did that so people didn't need to be DNS experts to go change names because it's just a web interface on Amazon land and it's cheap and it's reliable and it's good. That's his own file name. But they maintain it. You just no, but no it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a his own zone. Yeah. yeah, App Inventor mid -Edu is his own. And uh, now I played with other implementations of Linux. Anybody ever hear of CoreOS? <coughs> I played with CoreOS, got screwed. Really? Yeah, well, in particular, the way I screwed by CoreOS, I should say CoreOS and Docker. Yeah. I do a lot of Docker. Is, is that the one you mm, I don't know. I was. Anyway, CoreOS has this really cool auto-update function. And you cannot install packages in CoreOS. In fact, slash USR is read-only. The way CoreOS updates is there's a second USR partition that's empty, and the new version is loaded into that, and then you reboot into that version. And then the one you were using before becomes the available partition. This, I'm told, is how Chrome OS updates Chromebooks. And it has the, by being read-only, it means your operational people can't leave crap around, because the main system is read-only. But it also means you can't install tools that aren't there without really jumping through some pretty hairy hoops. But the, so, but the real kicker for me was the random reboots. I don't want servers that randomly reboot. So you can turn off the random reboots. In fact, I turned off updating. I said, I'll update this when I want to update this. And by the way, this is generally good advice, because you can spend your entire life on the update mill and go nowhere. Here's the problem. Docker can handle an update from one version to the next major version, but not two. 
So when I went to update some servers running CoreOS that had not been updated since two versions of Docker, I couldn't do <coughs> upgrade to this and then upgrade to this. No, it did the big jump. And then Docker started up and destroyed all its data. Fortunately, I'd back up everything, so it wasn't a loss. But I said, you know, I'm done with CoreOS. Then I went to a thing called Rancher OS. Now, Rancher OS is a pretty cool Linux distribution. If you like Docker, you'll like Rancher OS because it's all Docker. Process one is Docker. Init is Docker. They actually have two Dockers, System Docker and Regular Docker. Regular Docker runs your containers, and System Docker runs all the system services in their own container. INET D, NTP D, all the standard things that you see are running in Docker containers. But what I liked about Rancher OS is the image you needed to boot it was 40 megs. You just had to load this little tiny thing and then it just brought itself up. We say 40 megs is tiny. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. Another story, but later. Um, in any event, the, uh, what was I going to say? <clears throat> and it was one of the first implementations I found that let you configure everything from cloud in it. So I could build a YAML file with exactly the configuration I wanted and just say, start up please and come on up. But the problem with Rancher OS is it's really not a standard operating system, so a lot of standard tools that you might want to use just don't work on it. And that became too much of a headache. And these days, the Ubuntu minimal cloud uh, boot is 160 meg, which is close enough for me. Now, why do I care about this? Well, I'll give you an example. We run the build servers here on campus in CSAIL's OpenStack. And the reason we do that is because it's cheap, it doesn't cost me anything. But, and I need like 96 cores, which would cost a pretty penny anywhere else. But it's not maintained 24-7, staff's not here 24-7. And there was the day that a truck took out, or sorry, somebody digging a hole, took out the East Campus Chilled Water Plant. And we were told, basically, cooling was off. We had about 15 minutes before everything overheated. Uh, and I, they gave me 15 minutes before they shut down all my machines. And so in those 15 minutes, I spun up replacement build servers in AWS land. So that we didn't have a service outage. And that, I thought, was really cool. And ever since then, I said, I want to make it so that I can just start 100 machines if I want with like three commands. I use Ansible to manage all these Linux machines and a really cool package called Mitogen. Mitogen is a Python package for self-replicating code that does not require any disk space. So like I say, you can use a Mitogen slave child machine doesn't have to have any disk space left or it can even be read only and it still works. It uses Python, plays games with pipes, but the other cool thing is if you have a Python program that's like three different files and you do a remote call to one of them, it ships everything over. You don't have to send your program to the child machine manually. It, it does it all for you. It's really on some level of magic. And it's blindingly fast. And there's an Ansible plugin to use Mitogen. So if you use Ansible with Mitogen, it's about 10 times faster. And one of my playbooks, which I'll come to what, what I needed for in a minute, one of my Ansible playbooks needs to take a config file <coughs> on each machine, tells the machine to generate, basically has a key in it, tells the machine generate a key pair, give me your public key. It does this for all the machines, and then it takes all the public keys it's collected and pushes it out to all the machines. Well, guess what? That's n squared. So that playbook takes a while to run. Now, the actual file copies are fast. These are not big files. But Ansible itself has a lot of overhead. So the n squared really hurts. But Mitogen is so fast, boom, it's like, almost looks like it's linear time. It's still n squared, but it's just so fast that it doesn't matter. It's just, it was just shocking the first time I used it. We use multiple clouds. Uh, we have used Google Compute Engine, which is Google's answer to AWS. Uh, we use Google Cloud Store, we use AWS, we use EC2, S3, load balancers, we even use the IBM Cloud. IBM has a cloud, they bought it from SoftLayer. And why do we use it? Because we got free credits, and we are beggars. And I don't care. If I can boot a virtual machine, and I can give it a YAML file with its config, 
and it comes up with a rational version of, of Ubuntu and works, then I'm good. You know, as long as it's got decent performance, which it does. Yeah. Okay. Would, would you consider moving from App Engine if you're worried about it going away to um, their Lambda servers, the function servers? Because that seems like a super unnatural fit for them. They're very into those. Let me tell you what we're doing, because I already have an answer. Okay. In fact, the system I was using in demo was not the one running an App Engine. Okay. It turns out I have three different back ends for App and Meta. Only one of which, the App Engine one, is in our open source. The other two have not been released. I wrote the other two. One we call the standalone code, where the back end is on a file system on a Linux box. But it's one machine. It won't scale. The next one we call the scalable code, and I actually have slides to talk about it. Starting right here. Our new architecture is based on Linux servers. Now, let me say this about IIAS, infrastructure as a service. The problem with platforms as a service, like App Engine, is it's proprietary, it changes, the vendors can change it. They can change the pricing model. Google has changed the pricing model so that if you optimize your, your thing to get a decent price, they change the pricing model, it's not optimal anymore. And now you've got to go bang your head to figure out how to make it optimal again. But the beauty of making your, your cloud be Linux servers is the x86 architecture is not to the whim of a vendor. It is what it is. Similarly, if you're running Linux and you're running the kernel on that x86 hardware, virtual hardware, you're, you've got what you're going to get. So when I boot up a virtual machine running Linux on uh, Ubuntu Linux on IBM or AWS or Google uh, Compute Engine, it works the same way. Now, performance characteristics may be different. The disk may be faster or slower or whatever, but the code will run. Now, when designing a new system, I wanted it to scale horizontally. And you know, we have 80,000 users a day. Typically, our, according to Google Analytics, we have 1,200 simultaneous users during the day. Yeah, it's a fair bit. So it's got to scale. And now here's the other thing. I want to minimize the number of hairy components. Now there's an old saying, complex systems fail in complex ways. So I want to reduce the complexity. So what did I do? So I have Linux servers running Docker Swarm. And I like Docker Swarm better than Kubernetes, because Kubernetes is hairy. Swarm is really easy. You want to create a swarm by saying Docker Swarm Create. And then it actually outputs a string that if you cut and paste it onto a slave, adds that slave to the swarm. So building a swarm is something you can do in under two minutes. And when you build a swarm, you can create multiple containers that will then, it has a built-in load balancer. So it's, it's got a lot, a lot of cool stuff for very, very little setup. Now, not without its little foibles, which I've learned about, but it's pretty damn good. Now for storage, I use a storage system called Ceph. Now I'm gonna make these slides available, and that's actually a clickable link, C-E-P-H. Ceph has been around for a long time, it's very stable. It is a key value store. It's also a virtual disk, virtual block device, and they even have a POSIX file system. But the lowest layer, the key value store, is the oldest and most stable, and that's what we're using for people to store their projects. Yeah, just want to mention Federico, who most of you know here, is the maintainer for that. Oh, there you go. Cool. I love it, okay? However, it is a little hairy. You have to kind of understand how it works to really use it. Uh, but among other things, it's a key value store. It distributes the data out across multiple servers. And you can specify replication. So I say I want three copies of everything. And if there's only two, uh, two copies, that's OK. But if there's only one copy, we no more rights. OK? So I always have at least two copies of good stuff. And you can control how it replicates. So for example, I have a test cloud I run where some of the servers are in status center. And some of the servers are down at W92. And the replication is such that there's always all copies. An entire set of data is in both places. So <clears throat> it'll never be the case that all three copies are in one data center. At least one copy has to be in the other data center. And you can control this. 
if a storage server fails, it'll automatically rebalance as long as there's enough space, which is also cool. Now, the problem was, Ceph, like I said, is hairy. It, it turns out operating it is hairy. There are too many commands that do bad things without confirmation. Though this, they actually don't believe in confirmation. The things that really do bad things, you have to invoke them with the argument dash dash yes dash i dash really dash really dash me dash it. So there's no undo. For some things, there is no undo. Yeah, you do it and it's done. Um, now. I also needed a database. So the first thing I decided to do is minimize the need for database, for a database. So the, uh, when you're running a backend, a Java backend with lots of, of, of application servers, one of the things you run into is session management. Because you have session state. How do you maintain the session state among all the servers? In my case, it's easy. The only session state I have is who is who's logged in. All the other states actually in the browser. So rather than store who's logged in in a, in a, in a database and provide the database index as the cookie, the, that information is actually encrypted and it's in the cookie itself. So when you provide that cookie to the server to identify you, it knows who you are without having to, to consult the database. An interesting fine point is what login means. It means having a cookie with, with an active key. Yeah, it, it basically, it, it's, Effectively, where's your namespace? Yeah. Right? It's really where's your namespace? In other words, you, you maintain a Yeah. It's an identity with a relationship. Yeah. Now, it turns out we needed a database for two things. One of which is an admin thing, so it's not critical. The other is when you package an app, we return to you a short URL. You needed a thing for mapping that. So I decided to use this database called H2, which is a Java native database. It's really not for heavy lifting. Um, and it doesn't matter if it gets reinitialized, it just means people who package stuff might have to repackage. Um, and everything that's in H2 is actually also in the Ceph cloud. And of course, sitting in front of the Ceph cloud, I have Memcache to provide some performance. This is a real running system. So I already said, why Ceph, key value store? Uh, it's open source, by the way. I like open source, it means I can actually go debug things. Well, the code's actually not that hard to read, but it is hairy. I already said Docker Swarm. I like Docker Swarm because it just kind of works. And here's the thing. So I actually have two types of containers I'm running. Application servers, which run the App, in, App Inventor backend code, and storage servers. So these are Ceph servers. They want raw disk. And the problem is things like Kubernetes don't have a good stor story for how can my container have access to a raw disk drive that's not ephemeral, that's going to be there on the hardware I'm running it on. And with Swarm, I can do that. So I can lock this container to this server because it's got that disk on it. Ceph, by the way, uh, wants raw disk. They finally figured out that Linux file systems or any file system as an intermediary when you're building a storage system it only adds pain and, 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 and subtracts speed. So let's see. So one of the interesting things that I had to deal with, if the main App Inventor server is at ai2.appinventor.edu and it requires a Google account. Um, and there's a lot of interesting reasons why we require Google accounts. Good for each user. Yeah, so, but Hour of Code, Hour of Code is run by an organization, code.org. In fact, just uh, last week was Computer Science and Education Week where they encourage schools across the world to do an hour of code, and we're one of the participants. But the feedback we got was, an hour of code turns into 45 minutes when you spend the first 15 minutes setting up Gmail accounts. So they wanted an implementation that didn't require an account. So I implemented a system using our new code base. Uh, I spun it up in AWS land in Northern Virginia on five medium-sized servers, and it has on the, right there on the login screen, continue without an account. And if you press that button, it creates an anonymous account for you and gives you a four-word phrase that calls a revisit code. So also on that login page is a place to fill in your four-word revisit code if you want to come back and get to your projects. It looks like anonymous login. Yeah, it's exactly. It's anonymous login. And it works pretty well. 
and it met the need of Hour of Code, because teachers can say, all right, everybody, just press that continue without an account button, here you are, good to go. Now we ran it, like I said, in, in, in uh, we actually have two implementations. One we ran in uh, uh, AWS US East 1 for Hour of Code. Now we also have a, a collaboration with the Hong Kong Jockey Club. Did we hear the Hong Kong Jockey Club? The Hong Kong Jockey Club is sort of a charity. And their income is they have the exclusive right to all gambling in Hong Kong. And tell me, people in Hong Kong gamble. So these guys have a lot of money. And they give it away. So they're sponsoring us. They want App Inventor to be used in primary schools in Hong Kong. We're currently, I think, up in 32 schools. But, you know, there's a, they're on the other side of the world. So I set up a copy of my, we call this the scalable code, running in AWS in Singapore. And I chose Singapore because it's sort of close to Hong Kong, and AWS didn't have a Hong Kong region. That was the closest, I, they now do have it. We've been toying with maybe we'll actually move into the Hong Kong region. But we're in Singapore, and AWS is in, in our code is in, is in here. But here's the issue, and by the way, this is my simplified network. This is as good as drawing I can do. So these are Ceph servers. Of course, you're familiar with AWS. There's a back-end network. There's a private network. And then the public IP addresses are NATed. And this back-end network is regional. So if you have multiple availability zones, it shows up in all the availability zones, which is good. IBM Cloud is a more traditional data center. In fact, they use more traditional terms, like data center. Amazon says availability zone. <laughs> IBM says data center. They have seven data centers in the Washington, D.C. region. Uh, now, a lot of the IBM cloud is really old school. So, for example, in AWS, if you want a virtual disk, you create a virtual disk and you associate it with your virtual machine, and voila, it appears as a disk. Well, in IBM land, you allocate a disk in their sand cloud. Is it what? Is it no. <laughs> but it's iSCSI. <laughs> and then you have to configure the Linux kernel to drive you know, iSCSI and multipath. So you have to set it up. So they provide good instructions. Unfortunately, their back-end network does not span regions, which is you know, a problem. So the IBM cloud, you got a private, cloud, pu private network, public. Oh, and that's the other thing. Their public network addresses are not NATed. So whereas AWS, the public address is NATed. So your AWS virtual machine is one interface with a private address. The IBM cloud, there's actually two interfaces. One on the private network, one on the public network. We needed to move to the IBM, well, we wanted to move to the IBM cloud because we received a significant amount of credits. Free is good. AWS was costing us money. Money's hard to come by. Code.org was not paying us to do this. And oh, by the way, I'm not expecting them to. I had 100 gigabytes of data. I didn't want any downtime. Here is one of the coolest programs I've ever found. Tink, which stands for There Is No Cobol, which is an old Usenet reference. This is an old program, and it creates an encrypted mesh network. And it is like, it's scary cool. Now, the cryptography is old. I'm sure my friends who are cryptographers will poo-poo it. It doesn't use the latest and greatest ciphers. And, doesn't quite understand the latest and greatest way of doing blockchaining and, and, and anti this and that. I'm not moving classified data, okay? It's good enough for what I'm doing. But what's really cool is it lets me set up a virtual network that spans a very, what's the word I'm looking for? Heterogeneous? Yeah, heterogeneous environment. You know that I'm not sure it's what more So with this tool, I can create a virtual network that span both the IBM cloud and AWS and use that as my Ceph backend network. It actually worked, it was performant enough. And then I used it to create a Docker swarm that spanned both clouds. And then I spun up a new Ceph server in IBM land and I joined it to the cloud, to the Ceph cloud, and the system rebalanced itself. And I added another one system rebalanced itself, and then I removed one in AWS land, and the system rebalanced itself. Now, I didn't just kill it and let it, I mean, I actually told it, drain, you know, go away, and it moved. 
But what's interesting about Ceph is because I didn't just fail it, I said move, it still knew what data was there. So if it moved the data and then something really bad happened to the new servers, it could still recover. It could recover to the point where I actually deleted the disk, then it's gone. And uh, so I moved it all over, and then I slowly removed the machines, and one of the, at some point I changed the IP address for code.appinventor.edu from the AWS address to the IBM address. And then I could shut off everything in AWS land. Now, there was one little hiccup because I made a mistake, and so we actually had 30 seconds of downtime at 2 in the morning. So we were good. Yeah, our time. Well, most of these people are in the U.S., so it's okay. And it was not even during the computer science week. The load was very low. And it worked, and we're now running <coughs> in the IBM cloud. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about Tink. So what you can do with Tink is you can have two machines, A and B, and they each have an RSA key pair, and you share the public key with each, and then they can negotiate a session key, and they can talk to each other. And they'll talk, they'll, they'll do the negotiation over TCP, but the actual data flow is over UDP. Unless UDP doesn't work, and then it'll use TCP. So it tries hard. Now you peer B with C, and they share keys. And then A tries to talk to C, and B will act as an intermediary for them to negotiate a session key. And then they'll actually try to talk direct. So as an experiment, when I was first playing with this, I peered a machine, a virtual, I created a new virtual machine, I peered it to one of the machines in Hong, in Hong Kong, in Singapore. I created another one, and I peered it with a different machine in Singapore. And then I tried pinging between the two VMs. And the first ping took half a second, and the second ping took half a second, and the third ping took 10 milliseconds, because it figured it out. It's like, crap. And I was just playing with it the other day, I created a virtual machine on this laptop, okay? So it's connected through a, a Linux virtual bridge and you know, DNS masking, blah, 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 which means it can make outgoing TCP connections, but it can't receive connections. And I was trying to figure out how I can join it to the whole cloud. I joined it just to my laptop, and suddenly it was all connected. It all friggin' just worked. And I'm not exactly sure how, okay? <laughs> but it was just working. Um, it was actually, I think, routing the UDP packets through this, but it friggin' worked, okay? And it's like, this has no right to work. So by doing this, I can join disparate clouds together. It also means, for example, like my Ceph cloud for code in IBM land, the back-end network, in fact, you can't get to Ceph. It's not on a public network. Only those machines can. But if I join this laptop to that cloud, then I can get to it and manage it. So it's, it's really one of my favorite programs. And it's trivial to set up. And, and so remember I was telling you about an Ansible playbook that, that was an N squared? It's the playbook. I have an Ansible playbook for adding machines to that. So all I have to do to add something to the Tink cloud is add a line to this Ansible host file with the VPN IP I want it to have, the IP that actually reached the machine at, give it a name, and then I run this playbook, and when it's done, it's linked in. So we should talk more about it, but they would just wrote something about communities and devices. So yeah, this is pretty cool. And I think I said this. Um, I think that's all I actually have here. Did it work? Yes, it actually worked. I was actually surprising. Now it took all weekend to move the data, but that's because I told Ceph to make the data move a little priority. So I didn't want to interfere with actual user traffic. And you can adjust the priority, they call it recovery traffic. But can you take user machines, make them keep machines, and not worry about all the HTTP stuff and everything because it's just on the line? The problem, it actually by the way is a Tink app for Android. <coughs> but I, I have not played with it enough to know well, the problem is I can't expect a, uh, a grade school kid or a middle no, school. No, it has to, you have to have the right it to be something for you. It has to be complete, and I, it's not yet. And you know, one of the problems you have with all these phones is over time they're becoming harder and harder to configure because bad a actors are using them to install malware. What are my doogie phones? So, anyhow, that's, that's all I got. I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, so who can use it? Use what? Captain oh, you didn't Anybody. Oh, you, you didn't talk about China. How we can to think and all this other stuff. Oh, well, so China, well, Singapore is... It's Singapore, but, but mainland. Well, uh, Well, you can't. No, no, no. <laughs> Remember I said I have, an, I have a, a standalone version that just runs on one Linux box? 
Well, it's running on a really big Linux box run by the Southern China University of Technology in Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. And they're hosting that, and that's what people are trying to be using with. And it has a scary number of users on it. So you're not VPN from the perspective It's just its own little world, and it's run by those guys. And it's actually out of date, and we're not, we're not sure what's going on there. Now, we have other issues in China, which is there are large companies. China's, China's weird, okay? Really? Yeah. Somebody, there's one guy who says to us, he knows the Minister of Education, and the Minister of Education, he thinks he can convince him to make App Inventor a required part of the curriculum of every school in China. And China does run that way. If the Minister of Education no. says it will happen, What's hard to know is, does this guy really know the Minister of Education or not? I, I, I might be able to get some good content. Okay. So, meantime, there's a large company whose name escapes me at the moment that wants to run App Inventor infrastructure in China. And they actually approached us and said, as individuals, we should all quit MIT and go to work for them. They'll set up a research lab in Kendall Square. And we can build App Inventor for all of China. We have so far said no. I can tell more of the story when the camera's not running, but um, so so something's going to happen in China, okay? Something's going to happen. We're just not sure what. Okay, who's actually going to run? Um, if it was up to me, I'd rather a Chinese entity run everything in China and we provide the code as long as it's legal for us to do that. Um, and I have no idea what between the political situation, the legal situation, it's you know. But of course, well of course our, our app and we've not released the standalone code or the scalable code on the open source network. But are you planning on doing that uh, and when in the near future? We're not sure. Originally Hal didn't want us to release the standalone code. Not because it was so proprietary. Fragmentation. He was fragmentation. He was worried that schools would try to set up their own infrastructure and not do a good job at it mess themselves up, and then call us for help. And that's a real worry, given mm -hmm. the state of IT people in schools. That Now, I have in my head several different directions I'd like us to go in. Obviously, if you can do something in China, it needs to scale. But if they have some folks there who can cope with Ceph, because you really have to be able to cope with Ceph, and that's a good answer. Room is there, some technical people in China. Yeah, but whether they would yeah. wind up doing this is a different question. Yes. Okay? Another approach to scalability, which is not as robust as using the Ceph solution, is to use a lot of different standalone implementations. And then I have this external login server I mentioned briefly. They can all bounce you to the login server, and the login server, based on your account, can figure out which server you're physically on and bounce you to the but right it, one. It, but it, the way it is now, you can share, any group can share them with themselves, variables, or apps. Well, that's through CloudDB. That, that has nothing to do with it. Oh, that's a separate. Yeah. So these are more individual users. Right. Uh, now, um, in fact, one of the things that we set up the login server for is migration. We want to migrate off of App Engine. Mm -hmm. There's lots of good reasons for doing that. App Engine, by the way, code. the version we run in, in Cephland can handle bigger projects because App Engine, right? You have a, you have a 60 second timer that you have to do your thing in, or you get a hard deadline limit exceeded and you get blown out of the water. And their storage engine, Google Cloud Store, takes sometimes a couple of seconds to do things. And if a project has a lot of files, you can exceed that 60 seconds. And I love this. If you exceed that 60 seconds, you get blown out of the water. And any database transactions you have are inconsistent. We won't roll, we won't commit them, and we won't roll them back. They're so left broken. So you say nobody's trying to do production applications in this? So it has its moments. So it's just not the right paradigm for us. I think the app engine's a great paradigm if you have a lightweight website that doesn't have to do a lot of computation. It does some, because it is a dynamic environment. But we exceed what its design point is. It's a polite way of saying it, but yeah, well, that's yeah. why I was saying Lambda servers would be better for it because you don't have any context that you need. It just goes off and runs that. And can the problem with Lambda servers is they're proprietary. Right? I mean, I can do AWS Lambda servers, but now I'm, I'm beholden to AWS. Right. 
Okay? I don't want to be beholden to anyone. I want to use technology that I can run here on campus. In fact, one of the biggest expenses on the, all the cloud providers is, is egress bandwidth. And if we ran the stuff physically on campus, that would save us a ton of money. Now the downside is, you know, now we're running hardware. I don't, you know. How much hardware would you really, if you wanted to do it, how much hardware would it take? Not a lot, not a lot. But the problem is hardware breaks. I think it's really, really cool that any problem that can occur today with AppInvent I can fix from home, or I can fix from my place in New Hampshire, or I can fix it from Florida when I'm visiting my mother. Okay? From Hong Kong. Or from Hong Kong, or any place, I just need an internet connection. As soon as we have hardware, it's like I gotta drive in. And I remember the days where I had to drive in to fix hardware, I don't wanna do it anymore, okay? And so. I mean, one possibility is that have the cloud version when this hardware breaks. <laughs> well, in fact, one of the things we may be able to do with AWS is the virtual service in AWS, but we VPC back to MIT, so the external bandwidth is MIT. That, that's and the thing. I mean, people, they, I hate the, the, the terminology about private clouds and all that, but you, you can, a lot of the clouds think to be near locally. Well, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things yeah. that we can do. So anyway, we're, we're working on transitioning from the App Engine version to my new version. The th right now, the piece that's missing is the App Engine version has this thing we call the gallery. That's where Shrek was naked. And it's like, the guy who did that, which was actually somebody not from MIT, under a, a contract with NSF, and it was all, anyway, he tied it really tight to APIs in App Engine. So it requires a real re-implementation, which is on my queue. And, uh, but the way we're gonna do the migration, we've already worked out which is once we have the new system running, first thing we do is we get rid of the old gallery and put in the new gallery. Because the other problem with the old gallery is it's tied to a particular instance. The new gallery can be talked to from anywhere. And once the new gallery is in place, then what we do is we say, okay, we have the new system, and what we're gonna do is anytime somebody creates an account, we're gonna roll some dice, and a one in X chance will create them on the new infrastructure. And when we do that, the login server will know they're there. So when they log in, they get bounced to the new infrastructure, other people get bounced to the old. And then as we gain confidence in the new infrastructure, we'll make that ratio higher and higher until eventually all new accounts are on the new infrastructure. And the old accounts migrate? Then, the way we're gonna do the migration is when you log in on an old account, we'll again, throw some dice at first, but then the way we'll migrate you is when you log in on an old account, we'll set a timer for 12 hours. And 12 hours later, We'll check to see if you're not logged in, we'll migrate you. On the theory that if you're awake at 3 p.m., you're probably not awake at 3 a.m. You don't remember hackers. Yeah, but we're dealing mostly with school kids. <laughs> and so that way, we, we don't, we, we minimize the amount of hairy locking we have to do about, you know, migrating an account that's in these. We really don't want to have to figure that out. So we want to take a time when you're likely not logged in and move your stuff. And so what we'll have to do is, I'll, we already have a project exporter which takes your project and packages it as a zip file. And so we would just run the project exporter and export each project. Now there is a way to get around the one minute smack you down timeout. There is a way to start a special backend in App Engine that has a 10 minute timeout. But it has other limitations that make it unusable for normal work, but could be used for this extraction process. And so we would then move your projects one at a time and then effectively move your metadata and we're done. Now, I, I meant to say that when I was talking about the H2 database, because I wanted something simple. The reason I used H2, I know the camera's on, is because the other database we tended to use was MySQL. We've since moved from MySQL to Postgres on the login server, and I'm way happier with Postgres, and I may actually mi migrate the H2 stuff into Postgres. There's a Postgres replication strategy, it's just easier and seems to be more robust. And I, I don't like one copy of data. And so right now, the login server is running in AWS and there's a slave Postgres server running in a different availability zone. And it's been rock solid. So, and the, uh, the login server is running with Django and I'm actually playing with a thing called uh, multi, multi DB router so that read only transactions can be sent to the slave as well as the master. That's all database crap. Anything else? 
Yes. So I think, I'm, what's the sort of long-term plan for sustainability, right? You're mentioning things like free credits, and so some of the company gives you maybe some credits and you migrate, but like, what keeps us going longer? That is the $64,000 question. A lot more than $64,000. Yes. If you could solve it for 64 k it'd probably be done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's more like the $5 million a year problem. Um, this is a, there have been commercial spin-offs of Active of Inventor, like Funkable. If you go to Funkable, they're actually doing complete re-implementation, but their first implementation was literally a copy of ours. And it was started by two of the students who worked for us. Um, our problem, and by the way, everybody who does commercial spin-off, the very first thing they do is they don't support old folks. Or anybody, I mean, this is, I mean, you're obviously trying to reach uh, say to people that are, I mean, the whole point of this, right, is to empower, if you will, people That's right. with fewer resources so to get them sort of up to speed, right? So they're by a, definition not profitable. There's a YouTube video, which you have to pay for, called Code Girl. It's by an organization called Technovation, which tries to teach coding and, and you know, STEM stuff to girls all over the world. And they have contests. And several of the global contest winners have written their apps using App Inventor. And there's one that I know off the top of my head they talk about in this film. A group of girls in Moldova, they wrote an app that used location services. So basically, you're standing in front of a well. You fire up this app, and it tells you whether or not it's safe to drink the water from that well and what the contaminants are. And similarly, you can register a well that's not in the system if you know what its properties are. Because when you're in a place like Moldova, that's something you have to worry about. There's a group, the Davari girls. They live in this slum in Mumbai. And they wrote an app for scheduling when they can go walk to get water. All right? Guess what? None of these people are going to pay any money. They don't have it. What if it what if it with commercial versions? Right now, they live on venture capital. Well, what is their business model? Are they trying? I have no idea what their business model is. Okay. All right? I. Maybe they're working with another group of Moldovans that are running money through their company for reasons that are <laughs> yeah, entirely exactly. legal. So like, for example, Funkable, so one of the things the commercial guys do is they add, we don't have any components to handle ads. They wrote ad components. And in the case, they also wrote a payment processor component, Funkable did. But if you use, if you write your app using Funkable and you use their payment processor, which is the only one you can use, they take a cut. Of course. All right, so that's, so, so I can't see though how that could sustain you. Well, but it's sort of like value subtractive services. Yeah, how do you well, that implies it's possible to do commercially useful things in Appendix. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had one guy who was having problems mm -hmm. and he wanted help. And the power users, you know, eventually escalated could I help this guy out? And so I said, can you send me the AIA file? That's the source file. So I load his project up. And it's a project for Schlumberger to help determine whether or not oil may be in a certain location. Okay? The thing is, this reminds me when I did the system in Multics and discovered <coughs> grad students were now using for their thesis. Right. And so we have a <coughs> lot of people out there. What we don't know, all right, so like I said, we have monthly actives of 1.2 million, mm -hmm. right? How many would we have if we charged $10 a year? Right? My guess is 100,000. And that's, I think, on the high side. So if we charge $10 a year to 100,000 users, <coughs> that gives us a million dollars. Not enough. Right? Not enough. Um, I mean, at the moment, <laughs> years ago, I used to talk about PKI, public key, uh, infrastructure. And I used to say, PKI is always two years away. It doesn't matter when you ask the question. Well, on App Inventor, we have funding for another two or three years, so this doesn't matter when you ask the question. We, Hal's really good at, at getting money, okay? And so that's what's been keeping us alive. But, you know, Hal's going to want to retire. Hal, I'm going to want to retire. What's the concept? You, what's the concept? Um, in particular, the day is going to come where I'm not going to want a job, where I have to worry about my phone going off in the middle of the night. Or I might not be able to it, physically it, it, do that. Microsoft, the fact is, I know they've been trying to do a financial contract. 
Well, you know, we've not talked to Microsoft, but we should because Azure would work as well. But well, there's a cloud part, but I'm just thinking they, you know, the well, exactly. I mean, what we would love to do, okay, is to come up with a with a you know the users pay for it kind of model because that would go into you know, I'm pretty confident we can put our hand out. I mean, but not at the local that should be. Yeah, that we can get money from you know, IBM, Microsoft, and. And the other thing is we could probably, well, and the other thing is there's two different pieces to happen there I haven't talked about. There's the technical infrastructure development, but then there's a whole curriculum development and funding the curriculum development. And there are commercial organizations today that develop curricula that charge schools a lot of money to use their curricula, that then use App Inventor. You know how much they pay us? Nothing. You know, like that's more. Yeah. Not a. And at one point, one of them we thought was 10% of our user base. Yeah. I mean, Ryan might take care of it. Who? I mean, Ryan. They learn much. Well, we can talk later. Or another time because I'm exhausted. But so what about things like foundations? Or that, so Scratch, which we're vaguely connected to, but only vaguely, they seem to be pretty good at reaching out to foundations. We have not, what we need is a fundraising person. Who does these things? Yeah, so you don't have a dedicated to. No, we don't, and we really need one. We really need one. Because at five million a year for some of these, yeah, it's nothing. In front of these actually these billionaire tech people, it's not a surrounding error, right? Exactly. I mean, I'm the eternal optimist. I believe that this is an important enough project that it won't just randomly go away. That you know, we may get desperate, and maybe out of desperation we finally find the right people. But um, we could also, you know, I'm getting pretty good at running it on a shoestring mm -hmm. if I have to. And you, you, but you can't, I mean, not that this is possible, but you can't really detect or figure out who are large scale commercial clients. Right, we don't, right, we don't, we don't know who's, who's who. And there's no way, it doesn't sound like there's any way you could. Well, there's some, some things we could do. We've toyed with the idea of one of the things the login server could do is it could maybe put up a, a tell us who you are dialogue. Or a wiki type thing. But, but one of the things we're worried about is what happens in a classroom when that dialogue is given to the kids. Corey. One of the problems we've already run into is the Connecticut problem. Connecticut's a problem, and Texas is working on being a problem. So a number of years ago, when I was doing more networking stuff than I'm doing today, I was involved in Northern Crossroads, which is our gigapop here for Internet 2. And U University of Connecticut was one of our connected universities. And Connecticut passed a law that said, everybody who you do business with has to sign a statement that says they will abide by the Connecticut non-discrimination laws. Well, MIT's attorney said, guess what? We don't agree to be held to the laws of another state that we don't do business in. Now, we'll agree to be bound by Massachusetts non-discriminating was, which, oh, by the way, are pretty much word for word the same. But they said, no, it's got to be Connecticut law. You have to agree to abide by Connecticut law. And the way that one was resolved was they wound up having a subcontractor in the middle. So the subcontractor bought the service from us, sold it to UConn, and signed the paper. And charged them like a, a markup for doing that. Now we're getting schools sending us form letters that say we're obligated, Connecticut, that before you can uh, before we can have student data be entered into a contractor system, that contractor has to sign an agreement that says they will stay abide by Connecticut student privacy laws. Do you have, do you have use in Germany? Yeah. Do you have service in Germany? No. We worried about the GDPR. We, we're good on the GDPR. Uh, now, our attorneys have said we're not contractors. There is no contract that exists between a given school in Connecticut and MIT, so we're not covered by the law. But that's not going to, you know, you got some poor schnook working at the school who's been told you got to get this signed by MIT. And oh, by the way, there's a whole cottage industry that's formed to handle this because what the guy says is don't sign it and send it to me. Go to this website run by this third party company where you log in and you assert, I will abide. 
So it's like a clearinghouse. And so we've gotten these requests from Connecticut. We send them, we send me up. Now, what we do is when we get these requests, we send them to the attorneys because we're not lawyers. But what they send them is, hey, our reading of this law says we don't, you don't, you don't need to make us do this, and we won't do this. But you also don't have, I mean, you're, because you're part of MIT, their Office of Legal Counsel provides these services. That's right. That you don't have to pay for it. I, I'm at Harvard, right? So it's the same thing, right? We get, you get defense, a lot of defense, and MIT, it will never charge you, and they have very good people, right? Mm -hmm. If you had to go out and pay them $500 or $1,000 <coughs> oh, yeah. every time they send these forms. Yeah. We, we are well aware that <coughs> there are advantages of being part of MIT. Because uh, yeah, we get the legal services, never mind the payroll services, liability, and all that other stuff. So, for example, uh, copyright <coughs> infringement. We have right in our terms of service. If you believe your stuff's copyright, you contact DMCA agent at MIT.edu. We don't get involved. Right? Don't talk to us, and we'll figure out what we need to do. But, which also means when somebody sends us mail complaining, we send them there. Um, the uh, right to be forgotten thing in GDPR, the way we handle that's really simple. Somebody says, delete my account. Now, of course, how do we know it's the right guy, right? It's an email. And we say, go into the system and delete all your projects. And then let us know when you've done that. And if we see that your account's empty, we'll delete the last vestiges of it. This, an, an account with no projects in it is of no value. And we say, oh, by the way, after you tell us to delete up the last batch, don't go back because it'll create a new one. Because if you don't have an account and you log in, one gets created for you. Um, and we've had maybe 10 of those. Um, but especially because you're dealing with like under 18 now, the compliance is through Google. Oh, yeah. like well, one of the reasons why we started with Google accounts as a requirement was to deal with COPA. By saying, well, because Google accounts, you have to be 13, in theory, no one's under 13. Now we think we don't have to comply with COPA anyway because we're not advertising. We're not, we're not doing any of the bad things with the data. Uh, the, the only thing that we might do with data besides storing for you is we may do research and that's disclosed in our terms of service. Do you have communication between users? Hmm? Can users communicate with each other? No. No. In fact, the gallery does not permit commenting because we don't have the moderator bandwidth to handle that mess. Um, now, can users communicate by uh, uh, creating an app and then hiding in the app uh, some data and then uploading it to the gallery? Yes. There's all sorts of covert channels in the world. I discovered a new one, by the way, in Google Drive. You know about Google Drive application data? Is metadata for Google? No. As an application, you can create an area in somebody's Google Drive where you can store and retrieve data that they cannot access through the web interface. It's sort of like local storage in the browser. Yeah, except it's actually in the drive. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's cloud storage that's not reachable from the browser. Now, from the browser, they can delete it. They can see that you have data there, and they can delete it, but they can't get to it. Is it replicated down to your machine or just in the, in the cloud? No, it's in, well, it's in the cloud. Yeah, it's just in the cloud, unless you choose to keep a copy. So one of the things we're looking at, we actually have students who already implemented this um, for backup, because we have people who say, I believe in my project, can you get it back? No. So this would let them, if they have a Google Drive, back up their projects directly to this area of the drive. And why we would do it as a separate area is because to read and write the entire Google Drive require, is considered a sensitive scope. And Google will not let just anybody do that. I think with some effort they would let us, but but this application specific area is not considered sensitive. So the uh, so we're looking at that as we're not. I'm not super excited about it because I want to move away from having a Google account. The thing is, as you describe this, in my mind is to list all the arcane knowledge that piles up. The other thing that we are going to look at is allowing you to not only have, well, here's an interesting question. So we have a request from a lot of schools they want to use Microsoft accounts. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working on adding support for that. Now the question is, if someone has a, uh, a Google account of the form jis.mit.edu, of which there is such a thing, and they also have a Microsoft account that's jis.mit.edu, of which there is such a thing, 
In fact, there's two of them. That's another story. <laughs> do we treat that as two accounts or one account? Well, you'd have to do two unless they explicitly link them. That's probably what we're going to have to do. But you, you should have a linking mechanism. <laughs> well, that probably won't be done on day one. No, I understand. But, it, it, yeah, because there's no prevention from... Oh, it, actually... Well, no. Oh, here's the worst one. Bob.Frankston at gmail.com versus Bob Frankston at gmail.com. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we treat those as different. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the, the uh, number of things of this is... The other thing that frustrates us... Uh, another headache I have to deal with. By the way, we also have cases where schools change their Google Apps domain. So suddenly, joe at school1.edu is now joe at school2.edu. And we're using the email address as the identifier. Of course, as, I, as you know, I play, the DNS is ephemeral anyway. So, yeah, exactly, it's ephemeral anyway. Now, what we could do, well, what we could do is we, we do allocate our own internal ID, and we could provide a function for you to say, this other one is also me, but invariably people come to us after they've lost access to the old one. Yeah, but the idea of having your own ID is necessary. So, it's a, an interesting conundrum, but we are going to support the live.com addresses, or whatever it is. There's just no off to flow that I just have to implement. Um, and you have, oh, the, the thing about live is you have a number of different names associated with it. Yeah. So but, the base live ID plus the login ID. But the other thing we get that goes nuts over is the Gmail addresses are also case sensitive. Yours? No, but not Gmail's. Well, so, so let me, let me put, let's just say it. Back in the day, <laughs> like seven years ago, we used App Engine's proprietary authentication API. And for each person, it gave us a unique ID and an email address. But we used the unique ID for their account. However, that unique ID that you get from Google is only unique for your one server at your one domain name. So you shouldn't be able to link accounts that easily. So I can't use it if I want to create AI3, that would be different. So a number of years ago, I said we're going to use the email address as the identifier. The problem is that the big table database we use doesn't know from case insensitivity. So the email field, which was indexed, is case sensitive. So you didn't, you didn't lower case So I added a new field called email lower, where I lower cased it, but I didn't go back and fix all the old records because that would require a map reduced job that would cost 500 bucks. At some point, it's cheaper than looking at the deal with other stuff. Well, one of the things is a lot of our accounts come and go. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, we have 1.2 million monthly actives, but we have actually 10 million accounts. And we, we never purge them. I mean, our last purge was an implicit purge in 2013 when we moved from one version of App Inventor to a, no, a new version. Unlike Avis, which purges your purge your account every year. Now, on the code server, if you have an anonymous account that hasn't been logged into in six months, I knock it off. The chances are you're going to remember that four-word phrase after six months, pretty well. Well, that's the other cool thing I did. So, a project consists of the XML for the screens. It's actually funny. It's called .bky, but it's an XML file. And we have another file that is, the extension is .scm because that's the designer file, and we think SEM means scheme, but it's actually a JSON file. Mm -hmm. But then we have assets, like images, the kitty image. We probably have, in our main App Inventor system, oh, I would say a million copies of House Cat. That was House Cat up there. You know, he doesn't have that cat anymore. It passed away a long time ago, but that was Wilson. Okay? And I said, this is being used as a teaching tool. One of the things teachers do is they create template projects that have the assets in them. Clearly, we could do better. So, in the new system, the Ceph-based system, assets are stored by their hash. So I, I compute a uh, SHA-1 hash of the object and store it but with that as its name. And then in the project data, I just reference the hash. And so then I had to write a garbage collector. So we garbage collect the assets. But it's not a garbage collector that runs very frequently. I run, I've run it only once because I deleted, about two weeks ago, I flushed all the projects that were more than six months old, and then I ran the garbage collector. And so this database replicated across the machines? 
Yes, replicated this three copies. But of course, when I run the garbage collector, if I nuke something, I'm nuking all three copies. Yes. Right, that's just that's, that's prevention against hardware failure, not against me goofing it up. So that was a nervous day the day I ran the garbage collector. And what I actually did was I had it not actually delete the garbage. I had it list the garbage, and then I manually spot checked and convinced myself that that was really garbage. And then when I became convinced, um, and I actually did create a thing I called the dead zone. So I ran the dead zone for a week. In the dead zone, that's where I put all the garbage. And if at runtime you couldn't find an object you thought should be there, you look for it in the dead zone, and if you find it, you make one hell of a log entry and you send me a pin. And for a week it didn't go off. I was, okay. So I was able to flush 15 gig of crap. Um, so I thought that was cool. I had a good time writing that. <coughs> Nothing like writing code that has to work the first time. Yes? Can, it, can I ask an actual advent of programming sure. question? Because I have an app that I wrote in it. Um, and it uses um, the Bluetooth client. Yeah, BLE. What? Yeah, yeah. So I found when I tried to get a second page, didn't have access to that object. Yes. The multiple screens, right? Yeah, screens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bluetooth, and there's a couple of components that really only work on screen one. And I don't remember why. Okay. But it has to do with the fact that on when you're in the companion, it's one way, but when you actually package the app, those are different activities. Okay. And the Bluetooth code did not like being called from multiple activities. I don't remember all the details, but I remember running into that. Okay. So there's a few other ones like that, but yeah, you should use screen one for that. Anybody else? Well, thank you. I gotta get some water, but I can otherwise hang out. Disconnect myself.